reason for that is, is that the non-addict uses the word craving all the time. And what they generally mean when they say, I crave chocolate, is something like, gee, I really want chocolate a lot. That is not what the addict is experiencing when they say they're craving chocolate. They are up in the middle of the night. They can't sleep. They're sweating their brow. Their pulses are 150. They're thinking just one more thing. I want to feel the burn of that alcohol as it goes down my throat. Just one more time. I want to feel the heat of that gas pipe against my neck. Just one more time. I want to see the swirl of that blood in the syringe. It's what William Burroughs called the beautiful wave before I push down the plunger and every cell in my body says, thank you. That's craving. Make no mistake, that is genuine pleasure. That is true and profound agony on the same level as many cancer patients. It's very, very, very easy to lowball craving. And so you understand, once this has occurred, you don't actually have to have drug use anymore to have the pathophysiology of this thing go on more and more. This is what I believe defeats that choice argument. You remember the choice argument. Addiction's not a disease. Addicts can stop anytime they want. Put a bottle in front of them, and they reach for it, put a gun to their head, and they will choose not to use. That's true. They can, in the moment, choose not to use, but they can't choose not to crave. And that's the real measure. And so I think, in the end, the choice argument fails because it looks too much at the addict's behavior and what really matters you don't actually have to have drug use for this thing to go on. We can actually see this happening in the brain. We can stick addicts into uh, uh, functional MRI and PET scanners. You show them a movie of people using drugs to get them into a craving state. You scan their brain, and their mi midbrain lights up like a Christmas tree, and the frontal cortex goes quiet. The part of the brain that they need to say, I don't want to do this anymore, is the part that they need to say, remember what happened last time? part that they need to say, I don't want to go back to jail or hurt my family, that part of the brain is quiet. And this is what a neuroscientist would call hypofrontality. A, a psychoanalyst would call it denial. In AA, we call it the insanity. It is basically a failure of the frontal cortex to guide behavior. The normal top-down control of the cortex over the midbrain reverses. Okay? And this is, what, this is this combination of tragic tragically impaired decision making and zero insight on behalf of the patient that you see. And so I tell families when they come to family group, you know, you're going to take your, your son, for instance, out to lunch on Saturday and he's going to say something like, you know, Mom, I met the greatest girl. Oh, my goodness. We are so in love. You're going to love it when you meet her. She gets out of detox on Tuesday. <laughs> 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 That's hypofrontality. <laughs> How do you... <laughs> Keep one thing in mind, this patient is extremely vulnerable. They are preyed upon all the time. Cults, for instance, understand hypofrontality, and they go right after it. How do you protect this patient from their very impaired decision-making process, their impaired frontal cortex? That group of sober men around that sober man. That group of sober women around that sober woman. They are the surrogate frontal cortex that the addict can hear. Can't hear the doctor, can't maybe hear the job or the family, but they can hear that group of people that they've chosen to put in their lives. So if I walk up to my sponsor and I say, I met this girl, she gets out of detox on Tuesday, she's gonna grab me around the head and say, chucklehead, chucklehead, we talked about this, huh? I can hear it from her, okay? And over time, what happens is, we can turn the frontal cortex back on. The first part of addiction is down here, where the drug is equated with survival. But the second part of addiction is when that is carried up to the frontal cortex. There's a pathway of nerves called the median forebrain bundle, and it goes into the frontal cortex. And like I said, the frontal cortex on the whole is less able to control the midbrain. But there are areas of the frontal cortex that are off here. There are other areas that are a little more on than they should be. And those are the parts of the brain we use to attach. And so the second part of addiction won't see this in the abuser, is where the addict actually forms a relationship with the drug. They attach to the drug. When the alcoholic tells you that they love alcohol like they would love a man or a woman, they're not lying, because this is the part of the brain we use to do that. When you walk up to a cocaine addict and you say to them, 
you need to learn to live your life never using cocaine again. And you see that little ring of tears form in their eyes. That grieving. And there it is. You don't see that in AA. And so the task of treatment in conjunction with AA, maybe with some medications, is to go after both of those things at the same time. One, this, to give the addict tools to manage their stress and decrease their craving just to get them through one more day sober. And at first, that's largely what AA is. It's a big, fat bag of stress coping tools that the person can get in a very short period of time. But then the second thing here, to find that one thing for the addict. And I do believe that every addict has something that is just a little more emotionally meaningful than the drug. Now, what that's going to be for the addict, I don't know. For some folks, it's their children. For some folks, it's their family or their marriage or their new sober friend. For some folks, it's the discovery that they do have good moral values. And for some people, it will be something overtly negative. I don't know what it is, but if we can find it, we can use it against the drug. And so over time, the addict learns to manage their stress. They get a daily reprieve of the obsession to drink and use. Craving goes back in the box, and the frontal cortex turns back on. And the person that we know and love and remember come right back. Because they weren't gone. They were just a little <laughs> off. <laughs> so to finish up, this is our working definition now of addiction. It's a bit of a mouthful, but addiction is a dysregulation of the midbrain dopamine system, the reward learning system, and the cortical glutamate system, the memory and the choice system due to unmanaged stress. Genes are important, but it's the stress that does it. And the symptoms that we see are loss of control, craving, this is the one that gets everybody so angry. Persistent drug use despite negative consequences. You would expect that if the addict were faced with jail or the loss of their child, they would stop using. That's exactly what we do not see. We get in the addict's face. We say, I'm going to throw you in jail one more time if you relapse. What do we see? We see the drug use accelerate because we're stressing the person before they have the tools in place. So what do we have? We have organ. We have detail. We have symptoms. We have met the burden of proof. That is why I think we can, without the slightest shyness, say that addiction is a disease. That's a very tough standard of disease to meet. Organ defect symptoms, we can't fit a lot of diseases to that. Alzheimer's disease, we have no idea how Alzheimer's disease fits there. We can fit addiction to our definition of disease better than we can many diseases. Now, why is this important? Why have I brought you all this way? <laughs> Just to show this. Because something very important happens once we were able to say addiction is a disease and prove it. Once addiction became a disease, addicts became patients. And patients have rights, legally protected rights. And so this is the basis of the parity argument. Now things really start to get interesting, okay? But that's what we're going to do with this science. We're going to do what other patients with other diseases did. We're going to take it into court. And we're going to start winning some decisions on our side. And we're going to start unraveling the damage that has been done to this very misunderstood group of patients. And we're going to build a world with less crime, less suffering, less addiction, because addiction will be a disease, and the answers will start falling into place very shortly. Thank you very much for your time. There, are there any questions? I know we kind of ran a little long. I don't want to keep you. Um. Yes, sir. Do you, you want to get him the uh, microphone? Oh, that's a wrong number. <laughs> so I, I had heard uh, just even a couple, just a couple days ago about the statistics of uh, you know the termination of uh, drug users and, and and actually being you know the most you know penalized uh, uh -huh. society in the in Amer in the world and uh, what what I mean is there I mean especially the fact that we're not the largest populated country in the world right. what, what 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 is some background of why that might be I mean was it 
cultural aspect? Or yes, it's, it's a fascinating, and it's this is something I encourage the patients that I deal with to do, is to really learn the history behind their disease, okay? Because they didn't get a boring disease. They got a fascinating disease, addiction. Wars have been fought over addictions. 